We are jumping into our series and our second installment in our series called Upside Down, which is line by line, paragraph by paragraph through the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, I am so eager for what God will do through this series. We're calling it Upside Down because at the end of the book where we started, if this is your first week with us, you need to go get on the app or get online somewhere and find our study from chapter 12 last week because the end really informs the beginning. We found in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, that God's people live within the context in which we live, the culture in which we live, the reality of our existence. We live it upside down from everyone else. We don't live downside up, seeking to get all the things that heaven promises in our life down here on earth through the stuff and the routines of life down here. Oh, no, no, we live upside down. We live with our faith centered in heaven, our relationship to our creator. We fear him. We are in joyful reverence of him. We obey him. We view our responsibility to him as our highest privilege. And because we live up there in our faith, We come down and life gains tremendous significance. This is an upside down life. And this book is for our wisdom to live it. We need this book. We need this like never before. Our church family in this culture has got to gain all that God intends for us through Ecclesiastes. Because here's the thing. Everybody wants an infusion that changes their life, right? Everybody wants the secret sauce. Everybody wants the juice that's going to change everything. I mean, this is the stuff of marketing. There are so many products being marketed to you that will change your life. You just have to take them a couple times a day. You have to pay a friend on social media to be your supplier. Back in my day, we called that drug dealing. But anyway, (laughs) there's so many products promising you this because everybody wants this. We all want to see the cycle broken. We want to see things changed and we want to have significance in our lives. The harsh reality, though, is that we will never experience that. In fact, there are two responses that are cultural to the cycles and the insignificance that we experience in life. Two of them. First one is depression. There is just a massive amount of despair when we come to realize that this is the way it really is. This cycle of life and this routine of life, this wheel that we're running on, it's depressing. It's the stuff of midlife crisis. The second response is delusion. We're delusional. We act like it's not true. We try to hide it. Or we try to fake it till we make it that it's not going to happen to us. We're not going to be caught up in the cycle. We're different. We're going to be different. That is our cultural response. It is either depression and despair or it is delusion. We need a third option. We need a third option. We need cycles and significance. And that's what we're going to call this this morning. The third option is laid out for us in Ecclesiastes. It's an upside down life. That's the option. It's an upside down life. It changes everything. And we find it opened up for us in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to read them out loud, and then we're going to jump in and study them together. You follow along as I read out loud. You can follow along silently and read the words with me. And remember as we do that these are God's words for us. So let's give them our full attention, okay? All right, chapter 1, verse 1. These are God's words. Here we go. The words of the preacher the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All, everything is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All the streams to the sea run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new 
under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said? See, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Just a little pick-me-up here as we get ready to start the week. Just a little something for you. A little jolt to life. Okay? No, this is awesome. And with an upside-down life, this really, really changes our lives. We need this. Here's the big idea. Jot this down if you're taking notes. We're calling it Cycles of Significance, and here's the big idea. Upside-down life infuses, it's what we need, it infuses significance into the cycle of every life. Every single human being who gets the privilege of living in an upside down life, that is with a relationship to God through Jesus Christ as the anchor of who we are, our reality in heaven setting us on a course to live our lives completely different than everyone around us. Everyone who has that gets significance. That's what we long for. Significance infused into our everyday ho-hum routine cycle of life. And there are three aspects of life that get infused with significance here in Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11. There are three of them. And this is the big broad stroke, okay? So this is the beginning of the book. He's really setting up the whole idea. And then we're going to get into the weeds. We're going to go down into the nitty gritty parts of life and see how upside down living influences those. But for this morning, this is the big broad brush. Three aspects of life that get altered by the significance that's gained through upside down living, okay? So if you're jotting them down, here's how we're going to write them out. Here's our structure. If gospel significance is infused, then these are altered. So number one, if gospel significance, if my relationship to God through Jesus Christ and the significance that comes with it, my upside down life, if gospel significance is infused into me, number one, you ready? I see the cycle of fallen perspective. I get it. I see it. I'm not unaware. I don't live in some kind of bubble. I see the fallen perspective. I understand. And really, the first three verses of this book are a setup of Solomon's entire perspective of life under the sun. It is the fallen perspective. And without an upside down life given to it, it will have no significance. In fact, he does it in one sentence or one statement and in one question. If you remember, he's called the preacher here. He's talking about himself in the third person, very formal way to write. This is Solomon, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. That's our best understanding of who's writing this wisdom for us. The wisest man to ever walk planet earth until Jesus Christ, the son of God, came and lived here. No one has had what he had. And look at what he says about the fallen perspective to describe it. He says in verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now that, that is really hard to swallow. And I don't know what your translation is on that. I hope uh, my, most of you have an ESV, it would all say vanity. But I want you to understand that word. We've got to put a definition on that word that helps us. Um. It, let's just like get this out of the way. It's not sinks, like double vanity. You know, that's not what we're talking about. Those are really good for your marriage, by the way. That's free. But double, mar- double, double sink in your vanity. And this isn't selfies. This isn't vanity like I'm vain. I'm all into myself. In fact, if you're jotting notes, I want you to put one word that we're going to hold throughout our entire study of Ecclesiastes. Vanity equals insignificance. It equals insignificance. It is not meaningless as the NIV translates it. That's not helpful because there is meaning in life. There is meaning in the experiences that we have. But there is no significance without an upside down life. Everything is insignificant in time, how long it lasts. It's here and it's gone. In substance, what it's made of and how much is in there. And then in benefit, what we get out of it, what changes because we have it. Everything is vanity. It is insignificant. In fact, this word is the word vapor. It's the word breath. That's the actual word from the Hebrew language. And that's, that's pretty meaningful. This last week, it's been in the 30s here, in the 30s in the morning, and we have survived till today, people. We have made it. Now listen, the 30s mean we get to get our parkas on, we get to act like we're about to die. We get to use our seat heaters in the car. 
So that's like such a first world thing. And here in Arizona, we're like, oh, I don't know if I can make it. Get some bread and milk and get your park on. Here's what else we get to do. There's a little 12 year old stuck inside of here. I grew up with uh, both, uh, all my family, there's all kinds of cigarette smoking going on. So you know what happens when it's in the 30s? You get to fake smoke outside. (laughs) My mom was always mortified when I would do that. She was dreaming of me not being a cigarette smoker. Do I need to get this off my chest now? Like I'm not a cigarette smoker, that's not my thing. But I do still go out there and I have never once gone outside and not blown a little smoke out of the side of my mouth like my grandpa used to. When it's really cold, you should do it. It's really fun. My kids aren't in the service, so I feel no accountability. Now listen, that vapor that goes out the side of my mouth, that's this word. It's insignificant. It's here and it's gone. It's here and it's gone. And think of substance. Try to grab it. Try to catch it. Try to blow the vapor out and grab it. There's nothing there. There's nothing there to grab. It's there, it's gone, there's no substance, and it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. There's nothing that's consequentially different because that vapor has gone into the universe. That's this idea. That's the fallen perspective of life. Without an upside-down life that infuses significance, everything is insignificant. Unless there's a heavenly reality and a heavenly truth, I fear God, I keep his commandments with my whole duty, I'll stand before him in responsibility for my life. Unless there's an upside-down perspective, I can't see this. I'm only depressed by this or I'm delusional about this. But we're God's people. We're not cultural. We're Christ's people. We are those who live differently. And while the culture walks downside up, we walk upside down through this life. I can see it. I get it. I understand it. There is no significance unless I am redeemed and my life above the sun is informing my life under the sun. Which leads then to the question in verse 3. What does man gain? What does he profit by all the toil with which he toils under the sun? Like, how much do you get to get in the black when you leave here? When it's all over, and it can be over in a moment today, this week, we're not guaranteed of any more days. And when it's over, how much do you get to take with you? Let's give you the universal sign for how much you're going to profit in the long run from all the toil with which we have toiled. Universal sign? Okay, zero. Some of you did this, that's three. You know you're not getting three to go with you. It's zero. John Rockefeller, maybe you know this story. When he died, his attorney was standing before reporters, and one of the reporters said, how much did Rockefeller leave behind? And what was the answer? All of it. That's right. That's the fallen perspective, and we can see it for what it is. We get it. We understand it. It's what we lived under our entire existence. And apart from an upside-down reality, apart from a fear in God and a relationship to God through Jesus Christ, we as a people would just be like the culture. We would be despairing in that, or we would be delusional about that and try to stop that from being true. Actually, there's great significance if I can just get a bunch of stuff. And everything matters a lot, because I matter a lot. Nope, 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 nope. All is vanity, and there's no profit in all the toil with which we toil under the sun, unless... You have a life above the sun that's informing life of the sun. Okay? Understand? Upside down life infuses significance into the cycle of every life. There's nothing like being misunderstood. Isn't that frustrating? Aren't you frustrated when you're misunderstood? Isn't it hard when you're trying to tell them and they keep answering you back and you're like, that's not what I'm saying. Some of you had that conversation this morning in the car, didn't you? You did. You know you did, and you just looked at, you should not look at each other when we do these. I'm here. I see you. I see you. You tried to not look, but you did the side glance, like, "Mm -hmm." mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're frustrated by that. We travel internationally, and you got somebody who kind of knows your language, but doesn't really, and you don't know their language, and you're trying to get something ordered, you're trying to get something done, you're trying to communicate. You know how relieving it is to have somebody walk up who actually understands the both people that are sitting there and can talk to this person and talk to you and talk back? There's like a soothing reality to being understood. Listen, we are not a people who follow Jesus Christ and therefore cannot understand the culture in which we live. Oh, no, 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 we're the opposite. We actually totally see it. And we live upside down in it for the glory of God on the mission of Jesus. 
What's supposed to happen this week is there's supposed to be a bunch of upside down people going to work this week. There's supposed to be a bunch of upside down parents this week who totally see the reality of the fallen perspective, understand the insignificance, understand the zero profit margin when we enter into eternity and then live differently because we live above the sun. That's what God does. That's what he provides for us. This is wisdom for us. This is living with heavenly realities, informing my earthly life. Now, nobody, nobody did that like Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate upside-down life, living his entire life for what was true about him in heaven. The mission for which he came was informed by his relationship to his father. And we as followers of Jesus have the privilege to be called out by his name and to live upside down this week. I see it. I get it. I understand it. I'm not despairing or depressed because of it, and I'm not delusional trying to act like it's not true. That's the first aspect. I see fallen perspective. I can agree with Solomon. He gets it. He understands it. He's telling the truth. Here's the second aspect of life that gets changed. Gets infused with significance. Number two, if gospel significance is infused, I celebrate the cycle of created order. I am not depressed by the constant rhythms of creation around me. I am not delusional seeking to end them, try to make days longer, try to do things that we do to fight off this awareness. Oh, no, no, we are God's people. We are the people of Jesus Christ. And as we live upside down, we have the privilege of celebrating the cycles of created order. Look at how he explains it in this beautiful poem. Verses 4 through 10 are a poem that encapsulate the message of Ecclesiastes. He says in verse 4 down to verse 7, he talks about created order. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. In other words, it's just people group, people group, generation, generation, and generations come and go. And guess what happens? Everything keeps on going. There are people that left the world this past week. And guess what? The world's still going. That is created order. Generations come and generations go. We are about to lose a generation in our country that I was trained to respect highly. They're my grandparents' generation. We know them as the greatest generation. They're almost gone. Completely. To meet someone from that era who gave so much for what we enjoy today as a United States of America is a rarity. It is slimming down. There are very few generation uh, people from that generation left. That's created order. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it will always be. Look at how he explains this as he talks about nature. He says, sun, the sun rises and the sun goes down. Day after day, the same thing happens. The sun rises, the sun goes down, it hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit, the wind returns. Like to ask where the wind came from, you just kind of look at each other like, yeah, I don't have an answer for that question. The wind is just the wind. I don't know where it came from, it's the wind. What do you mean where it came from? Well, it's just the wind, it blows, I I don't know. It was here yesterday and it's not here today. And it's on its circuit. This is the cycle of created order. And then he says the streams. Look at verse 7, the water. The streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Like there's no point in history where it's like the oceans are full. Like there's no like news story that's going to break on Twitter this week. They're like, we've been waiting for this. Camera is set. This is the last drop of water that's going in. The ocean is full. Celebrate everyone. It's done. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen because of the created order in which water exists. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to do a little science with you. So please bear with me. If you're a science teacher, please be patient with me. There was a science teacher in this last night service and they gave me a B minus after I did this. And you know what we do with B-minuses in my family? We go out to eat to celebrate. That's what we do. (laughs) Nailed it. It Means I can keep playing on the basketball team. (laughs) Now listen, here's what happens, I think. I think this is how it works. Water, water's in the stream. It goes into the oceans or the seas. It evaporates up into the canopy of the atmosphere. I feel so smart when I say this stuff. I mean, it feels really good. It goes up. I don't even know if I'm right. It goes up into this 
and then it turns into precipitation and it comes back down in snow and rain and all that. And guess what happens? It fills up the streams and they run again. That's, that's the cycle. That's what happens. That's happening every day. That's going to keep happening every day. The sun is going to set again and rise again. And the wind is going to blow again. It's going to keep moving. And generations are going to come and generations are going to go. And listen, as human beings in this fallen world, our response to that is to despair. I don't matter. Nothing I'm doing matters. This isn't mattering. I don't have any significance or no time or substance or benefit for my life. Unless I have an upside down life. Unless I fear God and know him through a relationship and faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, then everything gets significant. Everything matters. And I celebrate the created order that declares the praise and the glory of my creator. I see his handiwork in the world around me. I recognize his power. Listen, this is the outcome and different responses to it, right? This is outcome of created order and different responses. This last week, people had different responses because of Super Bowl Sunday. There were people who had a hard week in America. That's a first world problem because they're 49er fans, which is foolish in the first place, and they, they didn't win. And then there were people that were totally nice two weeks ago, but they were obnoxious this week because they're Kansas City Chiefs fans. Oh my goodness, they're wearing all their clothes. It's red, it's bright. Oh goodness. And there's all of us. We just don't care. We don't care at all. We're indifferent. That's, that's, that's one outcome with three different responses. Now listen, that's who we are. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's upside down life. See, we live amongst the people. We are in a culture. We're not outside of the culture. We're not outside of the people. We're in there, but we see it differently. So we celebrate. Created order in an upside down life is cause for celebration of the glory of of our creator we are not depressed or delusional we are rejoicing at god's power on display in his creation here let me ask you a question let me just get up in your personal business for a second here here's a question for you how high does your praise go for created order how high does your praise go for created order when you feel it enough to say something i mean we've got some amazing displays of created order we live in Arizona. We have the most phenomenal sunsets and sunrises anywhere in the world, do we not? It's because of how much dust is in the air, but that's a whole other issue entirely. <laughs> we still have the awesome sunsets and awesome sun. I, I mean, I go home from the office here. I drive down Gilbert Road. I turn west on Queen Creek, and I'm driving right at South Mountain. With that sun going down, I mean, it is, it is glorious. But I'm just wondering, how high does my praise go? Because listen, the more upside down my reality is, the more upside down my perspective is, the more significance that's infused into that sunset. That's the handiwork of my creator. My kids tried to get a picture last night of the moon. It was so awesome. Jesus made that with the word of his power, and he upholds it by his strong hand. How high does your praise go? Because we're going to live this week at work. We're going to live this week in our homes. And we're going to be the upside down people there. We see the fallen perspective. We get it. And we celebrate created order. It's not lost on us what God is doing in this awesome creation that he's made. We don't just live bemoaning the cycle. We seek to celebrate what God has set in motion, knowing that there will be a day when we live above the sun and that relationship and that responsibility is informing life under the sun. Get it? That's what he's doing. That's what the wisdom of Ecclesiastes is. Okay, number three, last one. If gospel significance is infused, number three, I steward the cycle of human experience. I steward the cycle of human experience. I celebrate created order, and I see fallen perspective. I understand the vantage point of life under the sun. But because I live above the sun, because I'm an upside down person, because I fear God, keep his commandments as my whole duty, and I will stand before him in a day of assessment, and because I'm responsible to him, I view life differently. Gospel significance is, in, is infused for me. I'm a child of God. I'm a son. You're a daughter or a son. If in fact you place your faith in Jesus Christ. So now we don't despair 
at human experience, we steward it. We aren't delusional about it, try to stop it, try to act like it's not real. We steward it. Look at it, verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. There is so much tiredness to be experienced. We're not faking it. We're not uh, depressed by it. We are tired. But look at the second part of verse 8. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. This is the senses. There's never a day where you turn your head around and look at the last thing in your eyes. You're like, that's it. We can't take any more in. We're done. It's like hit full. We can't go any further. Some of you, uh, uh, your ears are failing you. Your ears are failing you. Failing. But they're not filling on you. They're not filling on you with how much you hear. They're failing you. Failing. Not filling. Two different words. They're not filling up. It's not like you heard the last thing and you're like, that's it. I can't get any more in. And your ears send a little signal. And it comes through your Bluetooth. You're like, oh, snap. The ears are full. That never happens. It's this insatiable unsatisfied reality of our human experience. That's kind of who we are. We're always looking at something else, hearing something else, saying something else, feeling something else. It's just this constant. It's this cycle. It never stops. And listen, as human beings who are in a fallen world, sinners separated from our creator, to realize that it just never ends and I never get enough and I never get filled up and I can never get anywhere. That's just depressing. And my alternatives are either to despair in that or to be delusional about that and try to stop it some way or act like it's not true. We live upside down. We steward it. We steward every breath. We steward every sight. We steward what we hear. We are managers of this breath of a life that we've been given to live as followers of Jesus on mission in Phoenix for him. The second part of this is in verse number nine. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. That's the most famous line in this entire book. People that don't know anything about the Bible will tell you there's nothing new under the sun. It's from here. This is where it comes from, from Solomon's wisdom. And he's right. He's right. He says here in verse 10, is there, is there a thing which is said, see, this is new. It's already been in the ages before us. There's no new categories. Listen, adventure is still adventure. Discovery is just more discovery. Communication changes are just communication changes. Engineering developments are just developments of engineering. All those things have already been. They've always been there. You're just on the wheel. And so am I. I say, man, that is is hard to hear. I've been hoping to produce something brand new in my work. Or I want to do something that's never been done with my life. And I agree with you, this is discouraging unless we have an upside down life. Then we take opportunity to steward the reality that there's nothing new under the sun. And to live our lives faithfully, to use them fully for the glory of God with every opportunity that is entrusted to us. See, that's totally different. That's a different attitude this week at work. That's a different kind of momming and dadding this week. That's a different kind of marriage this week. That's a different kind of engagement with your devices this week. That's a different kind of intake on your television screen this week. We're stewarding a human experience. We're living upside down in a culture that's living downside up. One more thing, verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the later things yet to be among those who come after. The big days are not that big. Your biggest day is not that big of a day. I know you think it's the biggest day ever. Listen, we got some couples in here who are on the brink of getting married. There is one date on the calendar for them. That's it. And just a few years from now, when you ask the husband what's their anniversary date, he will stutter. And he'll glance at his wife quickly and nervously. And then he'll get that date out because he has learned through fear. You can't forget that date. But you know what his brain is doing? Forgetting the date. Because there's no remembrance. Nothing sticks. History books cycle in and out. History is even regional. The history that's so important to you because of where you live and where you come from. If you don't live there or don't come from there, it doesn't matter. Nobody even knows about it. They don't even care. The names that you think are super important in history are names for us in this area to think are super important. But in other parts of the world, they don't matter at all. In the the other parts of the world that matter, they don't matter to us. There's no remembrance. My precious grandparents, my grandma and grandpa Bailey met each other 
at a dance in Kansas. My grandma was from Kansas, and her girls group, some kind of club she was in, uh, had a dance for the soldier boys who had come to Kansas to do training. My grandpa, Bill Bailey, Billy Bailey, was from uh, Mingo Junction, Ohio. That's a very small, small place. If you've never heard of Mingo Junction, welcome to all of humanity. He was in Kansas. He met this girl dancing. My grandma was always embarrassed because she kind of came from a no dancing uh, upbringing. And she was at the dance and she met Bill Bailey. But he was on his way to get shipped to the South Pacific in World War II. And things were urgent. So right away after dancing, like so many other great marriages of the greatest generation, they started talking about things that they had no business talking about after dancing with each other for one evening. They started planning. They started working hard. And you know what they had? They had a wedding that was a treasured moment of something precious between them in love. And I have the benefit of that marriage. Their marriage was phenomenal. But here's the reality. I, I, don't, know, I don't know their anniversary date. I, I never have. And I'm just one generation removed. And I was trained to care about important things from the generations before me. And I don't know. That's exactly what Solomon understands. He gets it. The human experience is your senses are never filled up. The human experience is there's nothing new under the sun. You're not going to do something new. You're just going to add to something that's already been happening. And the human experience is there's no real remembrance. Everything is insignificant. Vanity of vanities. Time and substance and benefit are insignificant. But, but if chapter 12, verse 13 and 14 are true... And we live above the sun. We have a relationship with God above the sun that informs our life below the sun and under the sun. Then we get to live upside down. We don't despair at the cycle of human experience. We steward it. It's so hard to be present. It's so hard to be present. Maybe like no other generation before, it is hard to be present for us. Devices are buzzing and ringing. Scrolling is happening. TVs are moving and fast paced. Always thinking that the next thing is going to satisfy. It's going to finally fulfill. Not for us. We're going to live upside down. We're going to live stewarding the vapor of our life. We're going to live stewarding the moments of our life. We're going to take them in. We're going to steward them for the glory of our creator and the glory of his son and our king. That's who we are. You see, that's the significance that comes. So you may have read Ecclesiastes 1 prior to this and thought, man, that is some super hard stuff. I think I'm going to go somewhere else in the Bible, right? I get it. Except chapter 12 is the key that unlocks all the significance that's intended for us as God's people. And it infuses the significance we long for into everyday ho-hum life that we live. Upside down life infuses significance into the cycle of every life. Well, Christ Church, we're never learning just to learn. So we don't want to just know what Ecclesiastes 1 has for us. We want to learn and then live. So let me give you three questions. We're going to go through these. Then we're going to take the bread and the cup. Our team's going to start scattering to get ready to serve us communion. But jot these down and let's consider these to get us moving toward a week that is influenced by Ecclesiastes 1. Number one. Where am I chasing significance for life? Where am I chasing it? If you're not a follower of Jesus, there's no doubt you are chasing significance somewhere. You're trying to get depth. You're trying to get uh, substance. You're trying to get benefit. It's better than it was. You're trying to get longevity and permanence. You're chasing it somewhere. You're chasing it with someone. You're chasing it with something. And the reason you're here this morning, for whatever reason you came, the reason you're here is so that you can know that your creator has made a way for you to have significance, eternal significance, infused into your everyday life. And the only way he does that is by taking care of your greatest need. You have a huge need. You're separated from that creator through your sins. You've chosen to rebel against him. You were born with a rebellious nature. Every one of us was. And you acted upon that rebellious nature and you rejected dishonored your creator as we all did friend here's the reality though that creator so loved the world that he sent his son into this world jesus took on human flesh and never sinned he didn't do one sin and then he died as if he had sinned all of your sins and mine too he 
took the penalty on his own shoulders. And three days later, after he died, he rose from the grave, never to die again, so he can break the power of sin over us, and he can break the power of death over us. And you can have that. You can have that this morning. You can be made right with him. You can have a relationship and a responsibility to him that is new through Jesus Christ. You can't do it if you earn it. If you try to earn it up and try to get your stuff together and be good enough, it's never going to be a scale tip thing. One sin, death. You need a substitute. You need a savior. Significance is being chased somewhere. You need to turn to Jesus Christ this morning. Say, how do I get it? You just turn and you place your confidence in him. You stop chasing it anywhere else. You stop chasing it in yourself. You stop seeking your own way. You stop the delusion and the despair. And you turn and you run in faith to Jesus Christ. You just acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a savior. You place your faith. You believe what you can't see because of the character of the one who said it. You believe stuff about Jesus, that he's the son of God for you, the Messiah for you, the savior for you. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And significance will follow the salvation of your soul. It's the only place to have it. And he's the only way to get there. Come to him today. Please. Come to him today. Church family, where are you chasing significance for life? You say, well, above the sun, of course. Yeah, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. We drift, don't we? Don't we drift back? Don't we have things we go to? We got status, we got titles, we got money, we got possessions. Where are we going? We drift. That's why we walk around in this culture and we don't seem upside down because we drift back to chasing significance where it was never intended to be found. Let's be careful. Let's be aware of ourselves as we live on mission this week. Number two, church family, how can I increase joyful stewardship in my life? You have to engage with the gospel. You need people around you. You need to live in small group. You need the word of God in you. You have to engage with God's word. You need to fellowship with God. You need to be praying, talking to him. Talk to him. Talk to him out loud. Talk to him. If the gospel's not taking root in you, it will be very hard for you to joyfully steward the life that he has ordained for you this week. I don't know what's coming. I don't even know what you're holding today. I know some of you are holding some really hard stuff. The only way you're ever going to be a joyful steward of that is because the gospel is so informing you that you live upside down instead of downside up. Here's the third question, I think probably the most needed for us. Number three, who needs my sympathy for their perspective? You see, God puts you in a community of people. He puts you in a circle, a sphere of influence, we call it around here. He puts you around people at work. He puts you around people in your family. He puts you around people in your friendship group. He puts you around people and strangers that you're going to meet this week. He puts you there as an upside down person so that they would hear the message of the gospel that you have. That they would know of the hope that lies within you and the joy that's in your heart. Listen, church family, you have to be sympathetic to the perspective of the fallen world around you. I'm concerned that we are jerks with people that don't know Jesus. I think of it like, you ever sit at a crosswalk, you're sitting there in your car, and somebody's taking too long to get across, and you're about ready to send your horn into their ears to send them to glory. I mean, it's going to be brutal. And about the time you're about to hit it, you've said a few things you probably regret, and then you're going to hit it. Just about then you see a stick in front of that person. You feel that? You feel that? You're like, oh my goodness, that's a blind person. Everybody's patient with the blind person. We're not angry. We're not yelling at them. They can't see the situation the way we can. We can see it, but they can't. We're kind. We're compassionate. Listen, I feel like we blast our horn all the time at people who don't know Jesus. They're blind. And we can see it. We understand. This is not compromise. This is not shaving the gospel. This is not being soft on things that are evil. This is not being unaware of eternal consequence and the reality of hell. This is being sympathetic to the perspective. I know why there's depression. I know why there's despair in your heart. I know why there's delusion in the way you're trying to make life work. I get it. And I'm here. I'm here to live something upside down in front of you. Let's be careful as we live on mission this week, to not blast our horn and then think that those are the people who are going to want us to explain the gospel to them. 
Be careful, social media users. It's an election year. That ends up being an opportunity for you to blast your horn for all the wrong reasons at all the wrong people. Be careful. Be careful, students, in your school. Be careful of the us versus them mentality. We are in but not of this culture so that we can shine brightly on the mission of Jesus Christ. To do that, we're going to have to be a sympathetic people who give love aware of the perspective around us, okay? That's what I want for us. That's what I believe God wants for us from this section. Upside down life infuses significance into the cycle of every life.